Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 95. Last week we saw where Jesus was heading towards Jerusalem and he stopped and healed 10 lepers at a distance uh, and surprisingly only one of them came back to show showcase extra thanks and praise uh, to Jesus for performing this miracle and surprisingly it was not even a Jewish person it was a foreigner right. uh, and we've seen that account several other times where even though that Jesus came for the chosen people the chosen sheep of Israel Oftentimes, he finds more faith in Gentiles, which is very disappointing for um, <laughs> his ministry to like his brothers, yeah, so to speak. Um, we then moved on to Jesus referencing all the subversions of what Pharisees, the crowds, again, he's mentioned this before, their expectations of the kingdom are not what they expected he had he said last week that the kingdom of god is going to be in the midst of you or within you yeah. and it's this idea of uh letting the kingdom be present in your thoughts and your actions and your deeds uh until the day of the lord actually comes and jesus reigns physically on the earth um yeah. and and then we some heavy stuff where jesus was saying that on that day it's going to be like the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah where everything seems normal, but uh, there's also lots of disobedience and evil being rampant. And uh, there, we're going to have this concept being present where it's not the righteous people that are snatched away and taken away from the earth, but it's the the unrighteous and the wicked and that the, yeah. the obedient people are going to be quote unquote left behind, so to speak, to, reap uh, the benefits of the kingdom on the earth and we try to dispel that misconception within the evangelical church um, yeah. and finally um, we ended with Jesus kind kind of pushing to not look back whether it's possessions or your former life he alluded to the imagery of Lot's wife looking back at the city turning to a pillar of salt it's like you need to die to your old life in order to be be a part of this thing that I'm starting here on earth and in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. This was kind of crazy stuff and some things that, I don't know, I think they're pretty common thinking among Christians in America, at least if we're talking Protestants and most definitely, you know, some portion of the evangelicals, whatever. Very interesting thing. And what's also interesting is as we continue through the text we're going back to that idea of left behind at least a little bit so uh you ready to pick up oh yeah all right we're still in luke chapter 17 we're looking at verses 34 through 37 i tell you in that night there will be two in one bed and one will be taken and the other left there will be two women grinding together. One will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken, and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Okay, point number one. If we were reading along, you may or may not have had a verse 36. That's the part about the two men in the field. Some manuscripts have it, some don't. I just put it in here for just so you know that it's there. It certainly doesn't appear to hurt anything in the context. It doesn't seem to introduce any strange ideas or anything. It fits right in. So could be good, could be, you know, uh, added. We don't know, whatever. However... There's some cool stuff in here, Sam. Are you ready to look at some oh, of these yeah. things? Sorry. So, so number one, notice, and you mentioned it in your intro. 
Jesus has been talking a lot about day. Something about, you know, like in the days or whatever, or on that day. But if, if you sort of read back, you'll notice days mentioned a number of times. But notice here, he begins with, I tell you, in that night. Ooh, where, where'd that come from? <laughs> so here's the thing. And, and this, I, I, I think people sort of forget about this. The day of the Lord. And when we're talking about, you know, the big one, his returning, all that. It is both day and night. It's day for those who are left, the righteous. It is night for those who are taken, the wicked. And those who are being taken are being taken unto death. So, I mean, obviously, first there's judgment, but their judgment results in death. So that's crazy. And we'll see a little more how we know that. But obviously, where the corpse is, there the vultures gather. You kind of get the idea. So just like in those earlier verses that you had told us about, we can see that there are those who are destroyed. They are taken. And those who are saved, they're the ones that are left behind, if I can steal that little phrase. And this, it's, it's made clearer in that final question and answer. The disciples, they're hearing this. And, and obviously, he keeps saying that there are those who are going to be taken. I mean, when it says they're left, you would never ask the question, where, Lord? Where are they left? You're asking, where are they being taken? And so Jesus' answer, it's an allusion back to Ezekiel. Now, there's too much for us to look at all at once here in the podcast, and it's good for you know people to kind of do a little bit, a little bit on their own. We're talking about Ezekiel chapters 38 39, there's stuff around there. You could even also maybe go look in Jeremiah chapter 7. But it, it's this idea that they're going to be taken to death and to judgment. And, and here's the thing, and you'll definitely see this back in Ezekiel. They are going to be the main course at a great feast for the birds and the beasts. So, Samuel, we just want to give them a taste. They can go look at more, but let's look at Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 17. Read what I got there. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds of every sort and to all the beasts of the field. Assemble and come. Gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel. And you shall eat flesh and drink blood. <laughs> Ouch. Does that not sound like the image that, that Jesus is referring to in verse 37? Yeah, that's similar. <laughs> yeah. And now check this out. Everybody wants to go to Revelation. You know, they, they, what is, what's going to happen at the end? And, of course, Revelation is much more complex and interesting than that. However, let's go to Revelation 19, very near the end of the book. And I'm going to have you read some more, Samuel. In fact, well, you know, at first, read, read some of it from Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Okay, still some more ouch, but it sounds a lot like Ezekiel thirty-nine seventeen. It sounds a lot like what Jesus said in verse 37. And you know what? Just a little bit more. Stay right where you are, Samuel. Revelation chapter 19, read verse 21. And the rest were slain by the sword, it came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Yeah. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So, again, clear image. Who's being taken? It is the evil, the wicked. And where are they taken? They're taken unto death. And birds feast on them. Beasts feast on them. It's kind of gruesome, but hey, 
It's important that we see it. It's upside down from a lot of the story you may hear in and around Christianity. So anyway, let's summarize it up a little bit, Samuel. Jesus, he starts out, and this was, you know, going into previous podcasts. He starts out warning the Pharisees that the kingdom, it's just not going to look the way they expect it to look. And you said it. In fact, it was going to be in their midst, and we even talked about how that might even mean within them. Good image. And then he warns his disciples that the coming day of the Lord, well, that's not going to look like their expectations either. It wasn't going to be, you know, when they expected or how they expected it to be. And he also told them what their response to all of this should be. Do not seek to preserve your life. That is your life here on this earth in this age. Don't try to preserve this life right now. Don't try to fulfill your own desires, etc. We must instead seek to lose our life. And again, that's the life on this earth and this age, etc. And what does that mean? It means we need to fulfill God's desires above our own. That We've talked about this all through this podcast. It's only by forfeiting this short, corrupted life that we might attain true, pure, eternal life. And again, this has nothing to do with whether or not you're physically dying. It's about laying down or laying aside your life, your wants, your desires, whatever, to fulfill the role that God has for all of us, and that is imaging him, thoughts, words, actions, all of it. And so, again, you attain the pure eternal life. So it's kind of a cool section, but also a little bit freaky. Yeah, I I actually wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about the freaky aspect or the... (laughs) Okay. Uh challenging aspect of these images now i'm not trying to pick sides or say that i'm in favor of you know the fire and brimstone type of preaching that lots of western evangelical churches do right but i guess i get how do we find this balance of i mean jesus is saying this stuff with his own mouth like he is he is declaring these warnings to actual people and like how do we mimic that in our time today when so much of the western church is all like everything is great like it's grace like look what god has done for you like you get to live forever you get to be with him like so much redemption and feel goodiness uh but i i just i don't seem to experience touching on this side of things too and i guess where's where's that healthy balance of yeah there is goodness and there's good news and redemption and everything but there's also this reality of what god's justice is going to look like for those that were his enemies Uh, it's it's a very hard thing to grapple with at least in our culture yeah well uh there's actually there's sort of like the the two extremes you've got the one side where Hey, you know what? Just say you believe and boom, you're in. Life is going to be great. You're going to heaven. Everything is wonderful. Maybe even some of the, what do they call that? Uh, The prosperity gospel Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of all that. So that's like on one side of the spectrum where, okay, something wrong with that. That's a little too easy. And then you have the other side. And that's more like when you mentioned the fire and brimstone where, Boy, you you better get right, because if not, you're spending an eternal conscious torment in hell and, you know, all of these things, which I'm, I'm labeling that as an extreme, the other side of the extreme. And the difficulty, Samuel, is I think that in our experience, which is just going to be, you know, modern day America, that is kind of what it all looks like. That's That's most of what you hear. And interestingly... I think somewhere in the middle is what we're trying to uh, put across on this podcast, and it's this idea that says, look, number one, there really, really is good news, and the fulfillment of that good news 
okay, you do have some access to it in this life. There is this foretaste of the kingdom that we've talked about, things like that. But the ultimate fulfillment, that lies ahead. That is uh, the coming kingdom, the world to come, those kind of things. So there is good news, but it's not, I mean, we would say, Listen, even if every day of your life here on earth is, you know, butt-ripping torture, it doesn't change the message. That hope still remains before us. And even in the midst of all of this badness in your life, if you have the proper thoughts, the words, the deeds, etc., in whatever your circumstance, you can still image God in all of that, and you will still see even in the midst of that horribleness, you may still find goodness or joy or peace or something of that nature. Now, on the other extreme, we we look at this and we say, well, look, uh, we're not really going to, on the podcast, to go along with this idea of eternal conscious torment in hell. We think the whole hell concept has been really mangled and misunderstood. However, we are also trying to get across this idea that, hey, you you do need to understand your life is on the line. And I don't mean this life and your physical body dying. I'm talking about life. God has given to every human access eternal life. He, he's given it. But it's not like universalism, like it, that that one strict form of universalism that just says, boom, everybody's going to go, and that's just the end of the story. Hooray, God. It doesn't look like that. Your life is on the line. You are, in fact, facing death, and not just death of your physical body, eternal death. And this is a big deal. And so you have to understand that something still rests with you. This responsibility, this decision still rests with you, and you must choose life. And in doing so, you're choosing God and his ways and all that kind of stuff over your own. It's We say it all the time, elevating God's will above your own. And so this, this balance is, is the, the, the reality of the actual decision, the actual choice, path, whatever you want to call it, that is before us, and the actual consequences of that choice. But again, the extremes kind of make it weird. It's not a prosperity gospel and it's not, you know, eternal conscious torment in hell. Uh, So I, I, I look at verses like this. And again, remember how we've seen Jesus on occasion. He seems to get a little testy. He seems to get a little, I don't know, grumpy almost. I hate to say it that way because he's, you know, Jesus, but what you, you know what I'm talking about, but he's trying to get across this is real. This is a big deal. If you're not taking this seriously, your end could be what we would call bad. <laughs> it's just it's bad. But it doesn't have to be that way. You've got that choice. Don't don't blow it. So I don't know. I I I said all that stuff and now I have no idea if I really addressed your question or not, Samuel. Yeah, I think you totally did. Um I mainly was just bringing it up to point out that Jesus here wasn't sugarcoating things. And I don't, I mean, I'm not saying that it's in my place to be going out into my circles of life and warning everybody like there's an approach to do things, but like a sense of desperation or urgency with like what you said with life on the line there might be a lack of that in the Western world, and maybe it's a call to us to try to mimic Jesus and saying that, like, you know, there's there's weight to all these things uh, with our lives. Yeah, and it's difficult to know. I mean, what is a really good way to present that? I mean, obviously, it's not like, morning, Bob. Sorry, the birds are going to eat your flesh. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's <laughs> OK. That's probably not it. But. Yeah, it's it's a difficulty. And then when you look to Jesus as an example, d- you do see that on occasion he finds it right and, and good to just lay it out there. 
you have a choice. And if you don't choose wisely, it is only death that awaits you. You are forfeiting life with God. It, it's a it's it's foolish, but I, I don't know. It presenting it is a it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything else? No. Let's just see where he goes from here. <laughs> yeah, people don't know this. We're recording this podcast in the morning. <laughs> this is a pretty rough way to start the day. <laughs> but hey, let's keep going. Uh, I, I think I think we got some good stuff coming. So this is in. Uh, well, you know what? We're continuing in Luke. We've moved to chapter 18, so at least we're making progress. We're going to read a long bit. This is verses 1 through 8. So hang on. Here we go. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that... She will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Okay, Samuel, have you ever heard this parable misinterpreted? I I believe I have misinterpreted it (laughs) in the past. Yeah, Yeah, this is a weird one, and it's it's so good that we get to talk about these, because I I don't know, I think it helps people. But, interesting point, it is super rare that that we get explanations of the parables, just generally speaking. We, we've we seen it, and it's great when we do. But in this case, the way Luke writes it, we get something even more strange. He gives us the interpretation before he even tells us the parable. Now, now this translation, I, I don't know. I think it's just a little, little funky. It might come across as a suggestion, but I think it's a little more forceful than that. The point of the parable is, is to impress upon them that they must always pray and not be discouraged. It needs to be your daily life. It needs to be more like who you are. So again, when Luke says it here in the ESV, it's like, you know, to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I don't know. That it, it is clear, and yet it doesn't feel very forceful. It's, no, th- this is a must. This has to become a part of you. It's just who you are, right? So that's uh, one thing. But again, we get the interpretation in advance. Now, details. Parable starts off with a judge, didn't fear God or respect men, which is to say, and I'm just going to say it this way, this is a judge who doesn't even care about justice. Certainly not true justice. Maybe he has his own idea or version of it, but this judge doesn't care about justice. Now, when we read the parables, you know what we've always done, Sam, we try to map the character in the story to who they represent maybe in like the real interpretation or whatever. And this is really important (laughs) because often what people do is they, they say that the judge represents God. Now, I, I totally get there, there is a sense in what they're saying where that is true. I, I get that. But we have to understand this judge, he doesn't actually represent God. He is not a picture of who or what God is. He's actually the opposite. So that's important. 
this judge actually represents something more like any unrighteous person who is to be seen in contrast to God. So I'm laying that out there, and I'm also recognizing, you know, Jesus himself is, he's making a bit of an association between the two, but it's not a symbolic representation. It's a big deal. Anyway, you've also got this widow. She's seeking justice, and obviously, I think we can get this one. She represents any person who is seeking justice. That's an easy one. And so we're to see this widow as, you know, someone who's who's likely powerless in the legal system of her day. There's so little that she can do for herself in the, the courts, the legal system, whatever. But she stands out from the crowd in, in this one very important way. She is persistent, like really persistent, like unbelievably, irritatingly persistent. <laughs> and if you've ever known a person like that, oh, it'll get you. But mm. that's this lady. And why? Why is she like this? You only act this way when you really, really believe that you will eventually get what you seek. It's it's another way of saying you have faith. If If she thought that her actions were never going to have any effect on that judge, she was never going to get any justice, would she really have kept it up? No, she really thought it was going to work some way or another, and it did. So so this judge, I mean, we get the story. He couldn't care less about this woman's situation, and yet he makes the decision to help her. And the text tells us why, because he just wants to get rid of her. So is he really seeking justice, Samuel? No. No, he's acting selfishly. He just wants, you know, the noise to stop. He's feeling worn down by her, beaten down by her. And again, if you've ever known anyone like this, you know exactly how that feels. <laughs> you so, mentioned adults, but it's that uh, characteristic is also present in young kids. Oh, it is, especially when the parents do not know how to let their yes be yes and their no be no. It's And you are so right. They're so good at it. So so anyway, this judge, which is an adult, by the way, we may as well clarify, he helps her to help himself. And on the whole, I mean, you got to say, it's really not a very uplifting parable if it just stopped right there. However, Jesus, he gets to the big ending or, or he offers his you know commentary on it or however you want to look at this. And here's the point. God is nothing like this unrighteous judge. We know uh, God in himself. He is he is the very definition of righteousness and justice. And here's the point. If even this judge who doesn't care about justice will actually give you the justice you seek when you're persistent, how much more Will a God who who actually defines justice, you know, be be supremely willing, overly willing, exceptionally willing to give you the justice you seek when you're persistent? So so in a way, you can act just like this woman because you can believe or we could say have faith that you will eventually get what you seek. You must always pray and not be discouraged. Now, we always have to throw this in here because humans can be very goofy. And so, of course, when you're seeking something, when you're seeking, let's say, justice in some area, some circumstance, okay, You need to be seeking true justice. You need to be seeking a justice that is actually in tune with God's perspective of justice. 
So I hate it when we have to put caveats on stuff because it sounds like we're, I don't know, hedging or limiting God or something. We're not. We're just saying uh, humans be human a lot. And so, you know, we have to we have to understand so much of this is about unity and and uh, uh, what's another word? Uh, I don't know. Just 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 being in tune with God, his thinking, his ways, all of it. It's it's an important part of the story. Anyway, I would just want to show a similar idea. Samuel, why don't you read from Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night, they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest, and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. Yeah. So, now, this was a message to the Israelites, and it was about them, listen, you know what God has promised, and you need to be faithful and unrelenting and persistent and all of that until he does what he says he will do. And that's another thing. When when God makes a promise, Samuel, how long does it take for him to fulfill it? Uh. <laughs> exactly. We don't know. It could be immediately, or it could take millennia. It's, we don't understand God's timing. And so our our faithfulness and our persistence, it has to remain regardless of how we think or when we think God should answer. But but again, the, the encouragement here is to be faithful no matter what. You just, you just be persistent. And Jesus adds this final question, and this is kind of weird. When he returns, will he find faith on the earth? And I'm actually going to modify that just a little bit and say, will he find that kind of faith on the earth, that persistent, unrelenting faith? Now, immediately preceding this, we had that talk of some being taken and some being left. And that, too, gets at this idea of persistence. And, and, and the idea is of us being faithful to the end, overcoming everything of this life. And, and it was, you know, specifically about the coming kingdom. So I think we see a bit of a natural connection between these two things. Faith is something we do. It is not just something we have. Our entire lives must ooze with both, you know, faith, the way we often think of it, it's like an internal thing, and faithfulness, the actual acting out of it. It's it's exactly what he will be looking for on his return. And so for each of us, I think we have to ask that question, will he find that kind of faith on the earth, and more specifically, will he find it in me. Mm. Those are those are hard questions, but we need to we need to start asking ourselves that kind of stuff all the time. It's good for us. Yeah. Um it's so cool to see Jesus pull out a reoccurring tool, rabbinic tool that he has been using so many previous times in the gospel accounts that we've covered already, uh that how much more Oh, statement yeah. that you brought up uh, that in Hebrew it's called Kal Vakomer, K-A-L-V-A-C-H-O-M-E-R. Yeah. Um, I mean, su- such a good practice for you as listeners and studiers to even j- just Google, like, how much more, Jesus, how much more statements, uh, Bible. Yeah. And, like, I mean, just a couple examples, like um, uh, Luke eleven thirteen about the, the differences between an evil father and a good father giving gifts. There's how much more in there. Um, Luke chapter 12, verse 24. This is about not being anxious and the comparison between the the ravens and the the flowers being clothed and taken care of and how much more being there. So many more, but just just wanted to point that out. Um, I also wanted to ask. Wait, wait, wait! wait. Oh, 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 oh. Can, can we talk about Calvacomer just one yeah, little bit? Yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. What is 
what is the super important thing when you're doing a how much more? It is that the thing that you're talking about in the first place, the thing that you're going to say, you know, how much more about or against or whatever, the important thing is that that initial thing must be undeniably true. Mm-hmm. So in this case, the, the, this judge and the way he behaved and all of that, everyone hearing this is going to just know this is absolutely, completely, and totally true. So no one questions the first part. And then because it's undeniably universally accepted true, at least in your audience, then when you say how much more so, it that's the real effect. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that in there because it, it makes the call of a comer, to me, much more powerful when you yeah. recognize, oh, yeah. All no, right, I'm so, glad, sorry. Go no, I'm, I'm glad you gave space for that. It's that from the light to the heavy or from the lenient to the strict. Uh, if yeah. something is true in this exaggerated sense that we can absolutely understand then of course it's even more true in a um, aspect of life that is more understandable for us to grapple with empathize with relate to um, that actually applies to our day-to-day yeah exactly Um, now i wanted to ask uh and this may be an unanswerable question but this concept of someone continuing to be prayerful, not losing heart for seeing God's justice uh, and his attributes being seen here on earth and his kingdom coming, what what do we do? How do we give hope to those who have been praying those things for themselves, for others, whether it's a family member or a friend that does not have a relationship with God yet. And, you know, they, they could be praying their entire life and that person dies and that, that prayer doesn't see fulfillment or it's with a sickness that doesn't get healed or, um, mistreatment of children or in the workplace, you can put any sort of example in there. How, how do we treat those examples where, like we know that we're praying the things that God wants and what he wants to see happen on earth but for some reason or another we don't get to experience God coming through in the way that Jesus is talking about here with being a righteous judge um to those who are coming to him yeah yeah and you know what what you're talking about Samuel is the dilemma or the conflict or the stress or the whatever it is that people feel about God and their Christian walk and things they read in the scripture they feel that conflict because we can read it and and it's so easy to walk away with this idea that well if I pray for it and, you know, I'm faithful to pray and I try to be a good person myself, God will hear and he'll answer. It's easy to walk away with that because, and this, oh, it's so, so hard. It is true because God says it kind of a thing. And remember before when I, I, I felt bad because I was throwing in that caveat, of course, you have to be seeking true justice, you know, something that's really in tune with God or whatever. And this is the difficulty. Again, we look at things like, okay, did Jesus heal everyone on earth while he was here? No. Okay. And then even harder question, did Jesus heal everyone in Israel while he was here? Still no. So what do we do with that? I mean, certainly God's will is for everyone to be healed. How do we know that? Because that's what we see in our vision of the kingdom and the world to come. Uh, We know that that's ultimately God's desire. But then you, you can't get rid of this idea that we live in a world that has been corrupted by sin. We live lives that are corrupted by sin. And 
somehow in all of this, God is fixing it all, and yet we don't see him fix it in these very specific and individual ways that we see. And it's like, you know, in a sense, it's almost you feel like you're helping God. Hey, God, if you want there to be no more sickness, heal my buddy right here. He's sick. You can heal him. Do it now. And the the craziest thing is that you will, throughout your life, see a number of instances where it's it's unexplainable. You'll even hear doctors say, you know what? I can't explain it. I don't know how this happened. But somehow your cancer is going away. Or, uh, you know, I've got all these, you know, images from before. You're riddled with cancer, and I'm looking at you now, and you are completely cancer-free. I don't even know what to do with that. You will see those things happen all through life, but it doesn't happen every time. And so in all of this, and again, it's so difficult for us to either accept or comprehend or something. It's like, on one hand, God's will is, yep, everything is going to get fixed, everything's going to get healed, everything's going to get made right, whatever you want to call it. On the other hand, his will, his timing, his more more specific will, if we could say it that way, somehow doesn't include this person. Why did, you know, uh, my spouse die, or my parent die, or my child die, or whatever it might be? And those questions are so hard to answer especially in light of a verse that says, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Boy, that sure sounds like he ought to just answer my prayer. And and it's a difficulty. And so there's, there's somewhat of a mystery that we all have to live with as Christians. And that is the mystery of God's will. God's plan and God's purpose for things. And it's even more crazy when you start thinking that, wait a second, are you saying that there actually could have been real value in this person in my life dying versus them living? And and crazy thoughts like that, and they are so difficult to explain, Samuel, but you're just giving voice to the classic you know, why does God let bad things happen to good people? And it's, it's, and the the simple answer is because sin. Hmm. You cannot avoid entirely the consequences of sin. And in a strange way, there is justice in that. But it's a very difficult part of our walk. walk. Does that help at all, Samuel? I don't know. Yeah, I just wanted to give voice to that because I mean, I know for myself, the church that we go to, it doesn't it doesn't come up often, but from time to time, one of the preachers or someone among the leadership will bring up an account uh, of a situation where whether someone's spouse was, I maybe mean, you could say, terminally ill, or uh, someone in had some type of workplace situation or conflict and the the specific request that was asked like to to the detail got answered and i mean praise god that's awesome it's amazing but yeah. um i just i i hate for people to get that conception that that's what their spiritual lives is go, are going to be like and it oftentimes can lead to disappointment and people losing hope and walking away from the things of god because that's not promised and I mean, someone could right. go their whole life uh, and not have anything miraculous like that happen to them, but that does not mean that God is still, that God is not present with them, orchestrating the things in their life, uh, wanting good for them. I mean, what comes to mind is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, like, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Yeah, And again, that's not a a mental ascent, um, ethereal kind of thing. I just need to get my mind in the right place. It's no, we're staking our promises on things that have come before us. Um, yeah. and that, that's grounding our hope for what our ultimate reality is going to be once sin and death are taken care of. Yeah. And see, that's a really good point. Now I, I admit 
that it, this can easily come across as a bit of a cop out. OK, I get that. But the funny thing is, it is also just true. Ultimately, when we finally do get to the end of the story, Samuel, will not all justice have been satisfied? Will not all of our, I don't know, true or or real hopes, dreams, desires, other, will that not all be satisfied at the end of the story? Well, yeah, because you're talking Hebrews 11 and he brings up a bunch of guys and guess what? They prayed for things and never saw them come to pass. What? What, what, what? How can that be? And they are, you know, we always call them the heroes of the faith. And it's, it's true. They're heroes because they have faith in God. They trust God even when it doesn't look like he's answering this prayer or that prayer or he's doing something that he's promised, you know, whatever. They have faith anyway. They know God is fixing it, working it out anyway, whatever that might mean. So yeah, good point. All right, what do you think, Samuel? The next section's kind of big. Do you think we can force it in? Oh, we got 15 minutes. We can do it. And hey, we've really got all the time in the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing about podcasts is if our listeners find it too long, they can pause it and come back to when it's convenient That's for them. That's right. You don't have to take it all in one bite. <laughs> all right, well, let's do it. We're going to continue in Luke, still in chapter 18, another fairly big section. We're going to read verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. All right. Now, we've heard some statements kind of like this before, haven't we, Samuel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because kingdoms, what do we say? From this world, the kingdom is... It's upside down. Upside down. Yeah. So Jesus wants to make sure that uh, maybe we could say we remain sober minded about ourselves and our relationship with God. And Now, Luke doesn't give us the meaning of the parable this time, but instead he just kind of sets up the story. This is for people who think they are righteous. And, and not just that they think that they're righteous, because there's something in, you know, self-evaluation and whatever, that, that's good. But they think that they're so righteous that they freely look down upon others. <laughs> Obviously, now the, that's gone a little out, out, out of the bounds, right? So the story goes like this. you got two guys that go up to the temple to pray. Now, one is a Pharisee. So... This is important. The expectation is that we're going to categorize this guy in our mind as a righteous person. Okay? If you're in first century Israel, at the time when Jesus is there, when you say a Pharisee, that's the image that's in your head. It's a righteous person. The other guy is a tax collector. So the expectation that you're going to have in your mind, you're going to categorize him as a sinner. 
Now, that may have been a little not intuitive to you, but maybe I'm just telling you that's that's what's going to happen in your mind first century, okay? So, this uh, supposed righteous guy, this Pharisee, uh, is at least, well, I don't know, he, he's thankful, I- at least in some way, if we're trying to look for a silver lining, okay? And, and he's thankful that he's not like other men. He's not an extortioner, he's not unjust, not an adulterer, tax collector, or he's, uh, he's not even like one. He you know, talks about fasting, tithing, and everything. Now, I, I, we just need to stop for a moment and take notice. Samuel, all these things that he's talking about, are they not good things? They definitely are. Yeah, they're good things. And so, uh, another side question, Samuel, we're all Pharisees self-righteous like this guy nope no no that's not what we're supposed to see here and if we could also say this out loud if you are looking around at your life and you're thanking god like i don't know maybe something simple you're watching on tv and you see somebody who's you know they're they're messed up by alcohol or something and and they they're really hurting their family is it wrong for you to go oh god i am so thankful that somehow You've kept me from that. I, I'm so glad that I'm not like this abusive alcoholic. Is that a bad thing? Not at all. No. So so don't get this weirded out. The problem is that he 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 looked at his own righteousness, and it led him to look down on others. If you were looking down on this abusive alcoholic like he was just a, a loser, as opposed to someone who, okay, maybe you could look at his behavior and go, yeah, that's what losers do. Yeah, I get that. But we need to look at him with some sort of empathy, some sort of desire for being able to help this individual, not just to look down on him, right? So anyway, uh, let's go on. The, the, The supposed sinner, this tax collector, see, he's only got one thing to say about himself, as opposed to all the stuff the Pharisee was saying about himself. He just says, you know what? I'm a sinner. But I'm just going to say, hidden in this text, we see that he is also thankful. But he's not thankful for who he is. He's thankful for God's mercy. Which, if the, the righteous guy, if he had been thankful for God's mercy right? Even in the the good things that he was doing, that would have been so much better. But he's thankful because he obviously believes that he might receive that mercy from God. It's, it's, It's an awesome picture. So even though his list is obviously extremely shorter, I'm a sinner, we can still notice or acknowledge that everything that he lists, okay, it's one item, but everything he lists, Samuel, is, is it not bad stuff the for the pharisee for the sinner i mean he only lists one thing i'm a sinner we said that when the pharisee yeah yeah. that that's a negative thing yeah yeah everything the pharisee said was you know it was good stuff and everything that the the sinner says well okay it's one item i'm a sinner but guess what it's all bad stuff okay but here's the thing we asked were all pharisees self-righteous you said no here's a new question are all sinners humble and repentant no. <laughs> no, they're not. Are they all thankful for God's mercy? Nope. No, they're not. So so Jesus delivers sort of this punchline. It's the sinner who is actually justified before God and not the righteous guy. Okay? He was justified. Do you want to say something, Samuel? Oh, I just wanted to ask really quick. You said that it was hidden in the text that we see that he's thankful. I, I, I guess I just wanted to ask that more specifically because... It seems like he's requesting for uh-huh. mercy, but that I, I don't know if that, in my mind, that necessarily means that he thinks that he has it or that he's thankful for it, right? Well, um, ha, boy, how do I say this? I mean, for sure, I could just be reading in or, or overreading or whatever, uh, but I guess what I'm seeing in it is this guy, okay, if you didn't think that you had any chance of receiving mercy, would you go to the temple and ask for it? Probably not. Okay. So he something in him, 
sincerely believes that it is something he might receive from God. He believes that God is capable of bestowing mercy to him. Capable and willing in some sense. Yeah, so he believes that. And so I'm saying that if he is if he really believes that about God and if he is willing to take the steps to go and seek it in some sense you know that there's a thankfulness in him that God is merciful that's all i'm getting at okay. so maybe i'm overdoing it but anyway that's that's how i, I see it I see that what makes you're sense doing. yep yeah all right so uh let's see where i don't even remember where i was now okay so it was the sinner who's justified before God, not the righteous guy. And then when we say that he's justified, what are we saying? We're saying that he is declared innocent. Now, Samuel, when someone is declared innocent, does it mean that they actually are innocent? Now, we're talking like, let's talk about human uh, legal system, courts and stuff like that. If somebody went to a court and and the judge pounded his gavel and he said, not guilty. Does that mean that the guy really didn't do it? No, that's just a verdict. I mean, right. The person could have done all kinds of bad stuff, but the jury found his case more compelling. Exactly. And that's important. So when you, we say that someone is justified, like in this case, this sinner, he's declared innocent, though even in this case, I mean, he truly has been a tax collector and probably done some pretty horrible things. It's just like when we stand before him in judgment. Are we actually guilty? Yeah. But we will be declared innocent because God, in his grace, will, let's just say, apply some of Jesus's overflowing, overwhelming merit to us. So it's important that we see that. Now, this is supposed to be, when Jesus is telling this parable, it's supposed to be shocking. And, I mean, it is. But Jesus goes on and he explains that true humility actually trumps or supersedes deeds. In this story, the sinner is the winner. (laughs) Right, But is that really the point? But let's just one extra little thing about that. Samuel, is it possible for a person to do good things for the wrong reasons? <laughs> 100%. Yeah, yeah. We just talked about the righteous, the unrighteous judge. He, he gave the woman justice, but he did it selfishly. Selfishless. Did I say that right? <laughs> he was being selfish about it. <laughs> It, so yeah, people can do that, and 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 I think that even though we see this, we see okay, yeah, the sinner is the winner. The the, <laughs> the sinner is the. <laughs> Did I mention it was morning? <laughs> the sinner is the winner. Humility trumps deeds. True, true, true. But is that really the ultimate point? Is Jesus saying? that living righteously is some sort of fool's errand, that we can do whatever we want as long as we're really sorry for it. Samuel, would you like to take a stab at that one? Survey says no. (laughs) That's right. But what he is saying is that a man can keep the law. And I, I don't know, I guess we could we could say he could even keep the whole law and still be nothing like God. In fact, I think there's an old uh, Jewish saying that a man can keep the whole law and still be a scoundrel. So it, it's not about keeping it for the sake of keeping rules. It's that it you have to understand the goal of the rules or the instructions, and it has to change you to be more like him. If we're just a rule keeper, we're measuring our success by our behavior and we either will or or may become puffed up. And this is not only the charge against this Pharisee in the story, but it's the common charge against the Pharisees in general. They, They were really, really good at keeping the rules for the sake of the rules, 
but they they seemed to miss it. They didn't really grasp the meaning behind the rules, and so they weren't changed by them. Now, if on the other hand, you don't just keep the rules, but you allow those rules to come to life in us, in you, if you allow them to define us, define you, remake us, then we will measure our success by how others have been cared for or lifted up or, you know, ultimately maybe others being realigned with God or whatever. So it gives us a much clearer and sobering estimation of our health, of ourselves. We're going to be humbled. You're not looking at yourself. What am I doing? Am I awesome? You're looking at others saying, are they being cared for? Am I being the hands and feet of God to them? It's as if we're seeing others more thoroughly. And if we do that, then we can somehow see ourselves more thoroughly. God isn't impressed with rule keeping if you're just an arrogant turd of a human. That that isn't what he wants. But God is I don't know, I guess we could say he is impressed or maybe we would say pleased or something with the Torah, that is the rules, the instructions coming to life in his faithful and loyal and humble ones, which is just another way of saying they are conformed to his image. So I don't know. I I see this story and I, I don't know, maybe it's, yeah, everybody just knew that. But I feel like in my mind, it's just so much deeper than what people normally see. And I just love it. Yeah. This whole discourse that you've been talking about just reeks of this Jewish, it's not black or white, there's gray, like your statement of uh, a man can know the whole law and still be nothing like God. And then on the same token, you can't expect to know God and be like him without knowing the law, knowing right. God's instruction. True. And so there's a balance there. It's like we can't take what we've heard today and say, like, oh, I've got to throw out the law because, like, look nope. what it, you know, didn't do anything with the Pharisees. No, like we have to know God's true intention and true heart behind the law. Yeah. And we can see that through the text. We can see that through Jesus's life. We can see that through the spirit, like coming alongside us as we study and pursue and seek righteousness in our lives. So, um, yeah, that's a, that is a lifelong teetering uh, seesaw balance to do right there. Yeah. Samuel, we've said it before. We're going to say it again. When we try to learn Torah, why do we do that? We learn to do. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing it is never the point. I mean, we, we, we need to seek it, pursue it, but that's never the point. We, we, we know it so that we might do it because in doing it, we actually know and understand God better than we ever could. We actually know and understand humanity better than we ever could. And we can actually love properly. God's way. We can actually bring justice God's way properly. Uh, He defines it the way it's all really supposed to be. And if we don't learn it through Torah, we're just going to have some weird alternate version of it. It's just messed up. Yeah, I'm I'm calling back to my old uh, high school FFA days. My Uncle Bill, FFA advisor, would be proud. Their mission statement is learning to do, doing to learn earning to live and living to serve there might be some hidden torah inside the ffa (laughs) yeah that's pretty cool i was never in ffa samuel oh yeah you can all feel bad for me now (laughs) but nonetheless i I gotta tell you i I was starting to feel like we started this morning with some pretty rough stuff and right now i feel like i'm on cloud nine this (laughs) this was the greatest way to end and i'm just you know what we're done and let's go with it Okie dokie. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please don't forget to leave us a rating and a review. And check out our website, www.okidokimos.com. Please feel free to get a hold of us at our email address, okidokimos at gmail.com. 
And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.